Hello, everybody. This is George Ann Hughes, and this is The Bite Show. And tonight, we have a very special guest. It is his first time on The Bite Show, so please download his file <laughs> a lot, and you'll want to after you hear him. Welcome, Nick Redfern, and we're going to be talking about the pyramids and the Pentagon tonight. And Nick is the author of 20 books, many, many interviews, and appearance, and he appeared on the History Channel, uh, Ancient Aliens, Monster Quest, and UFO Hunters. Hi, Nick. Hey, Jill Jen. How's it going? Oh, it's it, it, it's okay. Good. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> um, Nick, you you have a lot of information. My goodness, um, and this book, the pyramids and the Pentagon. Let's start with the Dead Sea Scrolls and secrets of the Ark. Well, sure, yeah. I mean, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, they take their name because obviously they were found on the Dead Sea yeah. in Qumran in 1947. And um, the the story basically is that a couple of young boys, teenage boys, actually stumbled upon them in a series of caves. And essentially they sort of tell early sort of biblical and historical stories um, from that particular region. And so, in other words, they've become very valuable to um, students of the Bible and ancient religion, but also history and archaeology, too. So, in other words, they sort of encompass a lot of different areas, and um, that's why they've attained such fascination, I guess, for people. But um, there's somewhere in the region of about a thousand of them altogether. People actually don't realize how many there are. And well, they, weren't, weren't some of them sold on the black market? Yeah, this is the problem, is that there are, there's like a collection um, of Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. which you can actually go and see, they're on public display. But there are a lot of stories about some of the um, scrolls initially, when they were first found, being sold and um, handed over to archaeologists or sort of Indiana Jones types who would sort of pay good money for them. And unfortunately, we may not know at all whatever happened to those missing ones, but we know certainly that they're around about a thousand and they date to roughly about a hundred BC and um, they they're essentially kind of like early versions of many of the stories that are told in the Old Testament and um, so again that that's one of the reasons why they're sort of so uh, revered if you like uh, but the reason why I mention this in the book is because there's a very strange story that links the Dead Sea Scrolls with none other than the CIA. Now, the year in which the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, 1947, is an interesting one because it was also the year in which the term flying saucer was coined when yeah. pilot Kenneth Arnold had his own UFO sighting um, in the Pacific Northwest in the Cascade Mountains and actually led to the formation of the term flying saucer. Um, it was also the year of the Roswell events, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls discovery, and it was also the year in which the CIA was created and the U.S. government passed the National Security Act. So you had a lot of strange and historic things going on in that one particular year. Now, in, when the CIA was formed in 1947, the idea was it would be like we'd have a network of offices all around the world to keep on, you know, to keep watch on potential enemies like the growing threat from the former Soviet Union. Uh, which we're now seeing you know, potentially looming again. But um, that's sort of beside the point. But um, back in '47, the CIA established offices all around the world, and one of them was in the city of Damascus. And the Damascus office of the CIA um, was overseen by a man named Miles Copeland, who had spent a lot of time in the Second World War, essentially working in the field of espionage and spying on the enemy and trying to deceive the enemy that, at that time, of course, that the Nazis and the Japanese. And when the CIA was created, um, Miles Copeland was asked, you know, do you want to continue working in this new organization? He, he jumped at the chance. And um, long after he was retired, we're talking about the 1990s now, 
um, he went, excuse me, the 1980s, he went public with a story about how when he was running the Damascus office of the CIA in 1947, a man came into the building sort of dressed in like flowing Middle Eastern robes and he had something that he wanted to show somebody in authority, he said, and so he was introduced to Mars Copeland and it turned out that this man had got what seems to have been a very early Dead Sea Scroll and it probably was one of these that sort of vanished from when the initial collection when it was first found. But um, he said there was something significant about this particular um, scroll and, and he handed it over to Miles Copeland and they actually went to the roof of the embassy and unrolled it all because it wasn't separate sheets. It was kind of, if you imagine something like um, um, like a, a paper towel for washing dishes, you know, you, you unroll yeah. it and it's actually all collected you know, connected by perforated sheets. That's what this was like. It was just like one huge sheet. So they unrolled it all and took pictures on the embassy roof. And um, unfortunately, it was so decayed in parts that some of it actually, the wind sort of destroyed it and even blew it away. Uh, but they, the photographs were saved and certainly some of the um, scrolls were preserved as well. And they were then forwarded to the CIA's headquarters at Langley, Virginia, in the United States. And from there, the story went cold and, and Miles Copeland couldn't get any answers as to what had happened, uh, why they were subject to secrecy. You know, you could imagine historians and archaeologists being fascinated by these scrolls, yeah. but why should they be subject to official top secrets? Yeah. Um, and one of the things that turned out was that supposedly the, the story that got back was that the document itself was reportedly an early version of the book of Daniel from the Old Testament. And it was filled with stories about prophecies and foreseeing the future and all sorts of things like this, like sort of powers of the mind to see, you know, things, future events that haven't happened yet. So one of the theories is that maybe somebody was at, in the official world, you know, in the spying world, was trying to figure out um, how the mind can sort of be used to see into the future, to forecast into the future, right. and that may have been why they were studying this particular scroll and, and why they classified it, because perhaps they uncovered something that was, you know, intriguing, but maybe a little bit disturbing as well. I'm sure it was disturbing. The CIA seems to get involved in a lot of things, like the Ark, for example. Yeah, well, I mean, the reason why is because whereas the FBI is responsible for national security issues inside the U.S., yeah. the CIA's job is to sort of keep an eye on what's going on outside the U.S. Uh, that's a big difference. People say, what's the difference between the FBI and the CIA? The FBI does domestic intelligence. The, overseas, the CIA does overseas intelligence work. And so it's their job to sort of keep an eye on, you know, the people who want to do us harm or could do us harm. And so they've got have a network of uh, offices all around the world in, in most, you know, major capital cities. Um, you know, there's one in London, Paris, Rome, etc., etc. And, you know, they're not necessarily all where they say CIA office, you know, on the front door. It's very often it will be like a small office contained in the relevant embassy, like the U.S. embassy in this country or that country. Yeah. That was where, like, Miles Copeland worked. His office, although he ran the CIA office in Damascus, the office was contained in the U.S. Embassy in Damascus. So it was like a, an office within an office. But, um, yeah, that, that's one of the reasons why the CIA have been involved, I think, in many of these cases. Um, you mentioned, for example, Noah's Ark. Yeah. Um, one of the things I often use is the Freedom of Information Act to get hold of documents that... You know, after a certain amount of time, in some cases at least, we can get to see them. In other cases, they still get withheld. But sometimes, if you're lucky, files will be released. And um, about 12, 13, 14 years ago, something like that, um, I filed a request with the CIA for their files on Noah's Ark because there have been rumours over the years that the CIA and also the US Air Force had had a deep interest in the story of Noah's Ark. And, the original story before the file surfaced was that in 1949, a team of U.S. Air Force personnel were flying over Mount Ararat, Turkey, which is supposedly where Noah's Ark came to, to rest, um, when they saw sticking out the ice what looked like two gigantic wings. It didn't look anything like a boat. It looked like two massive aircraft wings, but they were situated quite a long distance apart, suggesting that they were part of one object that had sort of split into two pieces. 
And each wing, if, it was, if they were wings, incredibly, was described as being about 600 feet in length, which would be, you know, massive for some sort of aircraft, if you like. Yeah. Um, and so they took photographs of it. They were actually, <coughs> excuse me, on a spying mission flying towards the Soviet Union, but they took a number of pictures first, and then they were analysed and developed, and, um, and again, but became classified just like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there have been a lot of stories over the years about spy planes flying over to get pictures and spy satellites even being configured so they could um, use high-powered photography to, to capture imagery of the object. And within the CIA, it's actually become known as the Ararat Anomaly. That's the official title. They don't call it Noah's Ark. Um, but over the years, a number of files have been prepared. And I got about 40 or 50 pages altogether from the CIA, which talked about how this interest went back to the late 40s, early 50s, and um, various senators and even astronauts had approached the CIA for access to their files, but nothing of any substance was really released. Um, we've got fragments of the story, and that's often what we get with these files, but one of the interesting threads that runs through the story is the idea that what if Noah's Ark actually wasn't just a gigantic old wooden boat? Yeah. What if it was like some sort of alien spacecraft? That it, that it was almost like a cosmic zoo where they'd been taking examples of all the animal life on the planet and then this spacecraft crashed on Mount Ararat. So, in other words, you'd have a spacecraft filled with examples of, of terrestrial animals or possibly their DNA rather than the actual animals. Yeah. And then it got mutated over time into like a folkloric story of a huge boat with two-by-two two animals on board. So... You know, that, that may be, if, if the CIA's interest was from the perspective that what if deeply buried in the, in the ice of, near the top of Mount Ararat is actually a crashed UFO, that would be a major prize if anybody could ever get up there. If the Turkish government would allow people up there to that one particular site, which they actually won't. Well, uh, why, why won't they? Well, that's, I mean, the, the official story is sort of like a down-to-earth story. They don't want people trampling around and disturbing the mountain and causing problems and wrecking the landscape. But, I mean, it's a little bit far-fetched to imagine it's, that's the only reason. Yeah. And so it's given rise to the idea that perhaps the Turkish government know there's something there and they don't want anybody else to know, and so um, they keep it off limits. Um, you know, certainly parts of Mount Ararat, you can go up. The problem is this one particular part of the mountain where this so-called anomaly is, is very near the top. You know, Turkey, people think of like a hot desert um, type of landscape, which it is in many respects, very barren. Um, but a lot of people don't realize Mount Ararat, because it's like 16, 17,000 feet high. At the top, it's like Mount Everest. It's like ice and snow and freezing. And this object is supposedly deeply embedded in the ice. And so it makes any attempt to get there almost impossible. And so I think that's why... They used spy planes and satellites to photograph it because there was really no other way to try and figure out what it was or what it, what it still is even. Well, with CIA involved and also in Iraq, um, a lot of ancient artifacts were stolen from yeah, well, the museum. I mean, why the preoccupation mm -hmm. with all things ancient? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a good question. One thing I would say, just before I answer the question, the, the big difference between the stuff going missing in Iraq is because Iraq was sort of very much, a, you know, in chaos when you, know, you had the uh, Iraqi war and so forth. Where, but whereas Turkey, they're our friends, they're part of NATO. So, you know, nobody, you know we're not going to invade Turkey because it's like invading Canada or something, mm -hmm. you know. They're not our enemies or anything like that. They're, they're good friends. As I said, they're part of NATO. So that's why... Pretty much everything's been left alone there. But yes, you're quite right that when it comes to um, to Iraq, um, there's a lot of very strange and unusual stories concerning um, the a, a variety of sort of missing artifacts um, from the Baghdad Museum when the um, uh, when the, the Gulf War went on, the, the Iraqi War. And um, what actually happened was that the, the museum itself was home to, I mean, literally thousands upon thousands 
uh, upon thousands of ancient artifacts going back to you know, ancient Samaria, Iraq, and other Middle Eastern countries. And um, many of these, again in the thousands, went missing when the invasion of Iraq and Baghdad occurred. Now, certainly some of the artifacts were recovered and returned and you know, made their way back to the museum. But unfortunately, a lot of them didn't. And so um, the U.S. military initiated a search to try and figure out um, who sort of pillaged what was called the National Museum of Iraq. And um, a, a military Marine Corps, actually, team was um, put in place to try and figure out where all this material had gone and what had happened to it. And this comes back to the question you asked as to why. There are a number of intriguing theories. Now, the military, you know, they did a very good job, um, you know, a very praiseworthy job of looking for all this missing material. Um, and as I said, also found quite a bit of it. But certain key things were not found. And again, they ran into the, you know, the thousands. Um, and a lot of theories were sort of put forward. One was that supposedly Saddam Hussein had uncovered... Um, what was called something called white gold. White gold is supposedly another term for sort of manna from heaven, which yeah. is you know, mentioned in the Bible. The idea that it's sort of, sort of I won't say magical, because that kind of sounds sort of more fairy tale, but some sort of chemical or, by, or substance, which it, when ingested could actually help rejuvenate cells or slow down the aging process. Well, isn't all it is is powdered gold? Yeah, that's what it is called, powdered gold or powdered white gold. Yeah. And, and the idea is that it's, like I said, it's light supposedly a manna from heaven, and it's also similar to um, a product the Egyptians supposedly had, but it all revolved around extending the human lifespan. Now, you find actually in a lot of ancient religious texts, you know, where people supposedly lived for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, they were sort of known as the men of renown or whatever, like Noah and people like that. Um, but... When you look at it scientifically, the idea is that it was maybe something created through like a, an, an alchemy type um, process where, I mean, it, it is actually a fact that we don't, there isn't like a really full 100% consensus as to why we age, why don't we just stop at one, you know, why don't we all just stop at 30 and live yeah. to 300, <laughs> you know, which would be good. Um, why is it that we kind of rise and we peak? and then we level off, and then our bodies start to deteriorate, and yeah. we've got, you know, sort of 90, 80, 90 years or whatever. There's actually no consensus as to why those cells suddenly start degrading. It's like an alarm clock goes off. And if you could find a way to disable that alarm clock, um, you know, you could potentially have immortality or something close to it on the cards. And one of the theories is that somebody looted the museum, we don't know who, uh, with a view to trying to find so, this sort of powdered white gold and try and figure out if it actually worked. Um, another theory is the, that Saddam Hussein supposedly, it's a controversial story, recovered a very ancient crashed UFO, and this is all linked with the stories of the Anunnaki, yeah. these sort of heavenly uh, creatures that have been perceived in some quarters as aliens that came down. And so, again, it may have been a search for advanced alien technology and I think that comes down to the fascination why there's such fascination for the mysteries of the past in not just the US government but we can prove that the, U the UK government the Russians were interested in the story of Noah's Ark too I think it all comes down to I think there's a sp suspicion on the part of a number of governments that ancient man possessed highly advanced technologies that in many respects are far in advance of stuff we have today and they would sort of dearly like to find them and understand these technologies. And um, I think they also have suspicions that possibly there was intervention from extraterrestrials as well as highly advanced human civilizations in the past. It may have been a combination of the two. And I think it's, it's, it's a matter of trying to sort of use the past and the weapons of the past and the technology to try and weaponize the future with technologies that, you know, go far beyond missiles or rockets or whatever. Yeah, <clears throat> well, <laughs> it's a fascinating thing to look at and to delve into, you know, but we just run up against these uh, uh, closed doors, if you will, with yeah, the well, CIA. That's one of the, yeah, 
That's one of the reasons why I use the Freedom of Information Act a lot. You know, people say to me, well, isn't it just all lies, the papers they give you? I said, no, they're actually not. You know, they, I, a lot of people sort of attack the government or the agencies, you know, criticise them. I've actually had a sort of very good relationship where, you know, I, if I'm filing a Freedom of Information request, I point out that to release these files might be sort of in public and the media's interest and from a historical perspective. Yeah. And, um I actually had a sort of very good relationship in terms of them making a lot of these files available, and certainly we're get, not getting to see the full picture. As I said, I've got about, I think somewhere between about 50 and 70 pages from the CIA on Noah's Ark, but if you look at all the rumours and stories, there would have to be thousands of pages somewhere. So we're not getting the full picture, but we're getting part of it, and I think that's encouraging that we get part of it rather than nothing at all. Yeah. So... But it, it is a matter of, I kind of pursue this like a, a regular journalistic story, you know, it's, um, if you're investigating a, a murder story for a newspaper or, or a police investigation, you kind of do it the same way. You follow every thread and lead and track down witnesses and documents and, and try and put the full picture together. There. What does um, Apollo 15 pilot James B. Irwin, how does he fit into this? Oh, well, Erwin's um, an interesting, or he was, I should say, he's unfortunately passed away now, but um, a very, uh, you know, perhaps somebody who's got a major place in um, U.S. history, and uh, the main reason why, uh, one of many reasons, but the main reason um, was because um, he was actually the pilot of NASA's Apollo 15 lunar module, you know, one of the sort of, I guess, dozen or so people that have ever been on the moon. And... Um, Irwin had a, a fascination um, with the story of Noah's Ark, and he actually went on a number of expeditions to Mount Ararat. He, um, he developed sort of a, uh, almost like an obsession, not in an unhealthy sense, but um, a driven, you know, like a driven um, push to, to try and find it. Yeah. And what's interesting uh, was that in the early 1980s, he actually telephoned at home a man named uh, Dino Brugioni, um, who worked for the CIA's National Photographic Interpretation Center. And these are the guys whose job it is to sort of analyze film footage and satellite, spy satellite footage of things like North Korea missile bases, that kind of thing. You know, they try and figure out what the photographs show and what's going on there. Now, what's interesting is that Irwin should have phoned Brugioni. Somehow, um, you know, he must have known that Brugioni was somehow linked with the story of Noah's Ark and the CIA. And certainly, years later, um, he actually did comment um, about his knowledge on the fact that something, at least, he didn't call it Noah's Ark, but something was on Mount Ararat. Um, but how Irwin found out all this way back in 1982, we don't know. So that's kind of, again, why it makes me think there's far more to the story than we know, because little snippets like this. And yes. One other one I talk about in the book, mm -hmm. And this is mentioned in the official files that the CIA declassified. Um, it talks about how in 1975, a man named Thomas Nelson um, wrote a book called The Ark of Ararat. And um, the, this was not the only book that was published in 1975 that the CIA took an interest in. Another one was called Noah's Ark, I Touched It. It was written by a man named Fernand Navarra. And for some reason, in 75, the interest seemed to have increased. Uh, to the extent that when Fernand Navarre actually gave a lecture um, in a Washington, D.C. shopping mall uh, called the Iverson Mall, um, CIA agents were actually in the audience in the shopping mall listening to him talk and promote his <laughs> new book. So that, you know, if, if agencies are going to the extent of sending personnel out to sit in the audience at lectures on Noah's Ark, then clearly... They're viewing it as something far beyond just an archaeological mystery. And again, this sort of gives rise to the, the big question of why so much interest? Why buy book, you know, why the CIA buying books on Noah's Ark? Why are they going out and listening to authors talk about what is essentially, we're told at least, just an old boat? You know, you can imagine the CIA going out if somebody, you know, a Russian spy writes his memoirs and it spills the beans on what's going on in the Kremlin. That yeah. makes sense. But from the CIA's mandate as to what its job is, you know, it's kind of puzzling 
that they would take an interest in Noah's Ark if it is just an ark and not something more significant. I, I get the strong feeling that the reason they're interested is not because it's an old boat, but because it is an early, um, oh, what would you call it, an early... Um, well, I kind of call it an ancient Roswell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sort of, yeah. Everybody thinks of crashed UFOs and dead aliens. They think of Roswell, 1947, the New Mexico desert. There's actually a very interesting theory that was um, first formulated back in the 1950s by George Van Tassel. And George Van Tassel was one of the early contactees, people who claimed sort of benign alien human contact, not sort of today's abduction with the little greys. What, what but, year was this? Oh, this was um, 1953, and he okay. actually used to work with Howard Hughes at Hughes, Air, Hughes Aircraft. He was a good friend of Howard Hughes, and um, he was an aviation expert as well. And in the early 50s, he moved out to a place called Giant Rock in California, which is um, near the town of Landers in the California desert. Yeah. And it's called Giant Rock because there's this huge rock out there. And um, Van Tassel claimed a number of face-to-face -face encounters with very human-looking aliens and um, who imparted a lot of sort of wisdom and warnings about, you know, the perils of atomic war and things like that. And Van Tassel um, developed this theory partly based on his own research but also on supposedly what the aliens told him, that Noah's Ark was... Um, like an alien spacecraft and it had come to the earth or the, apparently there were like numerous arcs you know there was almost like a fleet of them yeah. that came over various hundreds of years and for various reasons and one of them was to capture examples of animal life on the planet you know just um, lions, tigers, dogs, cats, literally everything mm -hmm. now what's interesting is that if you read the original translations of the Bible, they actually don't, they don't talk about two by two animals going on board. Um, no. The, the, uh, what they actually talk about is the essence of the animal. Yes. And that kind of sounds like, you, we could be talking about the DNA or cells, you know. Yes. I mean, if you think about it literally, if you take, I, I don't take the story of Noah's Ark literally by any means, but if you think about it, how would Earth would Noah travel the planet in such a short time how would he convince two man-eating lions to get on a boat? How would he get two full-size, ten-foot-tall polar bears on board, you know, and not yeah. get eaten in the process? There's a lot of problems. But if you've got, if you're talking about aliens extracting DNA and preserving the DNA in capsules and rows and, you know, in labs, that might explain the term, the essence of the animals. Yeah. And so the idea that Van Tassel developed was that this arc came down to preserve the examples of all the animals and because they realized there was going to be a huge flood and much of humanity and the planet was going to be overwhelmed by water. So the aliens supposedly took emergency steps and essentially took examples of the human population, the animal population, so they could reseed it after the flood had finished. But something went wrong with one of these multiple arcs and it came down on Mount Ararat. What's interesting is that, you know, when it comes to the whole ancient astronauts, ancient alien scenario that Van Tassel talked about, everybody's heard of sort of Zechariah Sitchin and Eric Von Danik and um, the Van Tassel was, to, but this is sort of, you know, sort of 70s, 80s and late 60s onwards, but Van Tassel was talking about all this in the early 50s, so he was very much like a trendsetter long before it was kind of fashionable and common to talk about um, ancient aliens. Yeah, I'd like to see them put uh, a male and a female whale on there, or a walrus, or a pair of walruses. Yeah, I mean, anything that's sort of really violent animal that likes to eat meat and yeah. is bigger than us. You know, it's like, in th it sounds simple. Oh, God said to Adam, you know, I mean to Noah, put two by two animals on the, on the ship. But if you've got to travel the planet and get, to, how are you going to get into the you know, the Amazon jungle and get two of every single creature that lives there and then zip off to the North Pole and then yeah. Europe and then to Australia to get two kangaroos. You know, I'd like to watch somebody round up two bouncing kangaroos that bounce Ooh, like yeah. miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not poking fun at people who believe that. What I'm saying is, if you believe it, you have to offer a rational theory as how it was achieved. But if you talk about 
the essence of the animal, then you've got a different thing. And what a lot of people don't realise is that <coughs> there are numerous um, flood stories. Uh, for example, um, if you look at the Native American law, they have stories of, for example, magical canoes yes. surviving a great flood that was sort of connected with the handiwork of, of the gods, if you like. Mm -hmm. And um, you also have stories uh, from India, very similar to, where another family, not known his family, but an Indian family survived a great flood. But it, was not, you know, it wasn't anywhere near Mount Ararat, it was actually in northern India. Yes. And this story actually date, predates, um, there's also a Mesopotamian one that predates the Noah story. So there probably were like localized large floods or possibly even a worldwide flood, you know, maybe something even like a polar tilt. That's been suspected, you know, yeah. the, the planet underwent some violent tilt and maybe a civilization in some respects not too unlike ours may have been obliterated, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 years ago and what we have today are sort of the the cultural legends and folklores that have been distorted over time to where, you know, it, it becomes just Noah's Ark. But as I said, a lot of people just focus on Noah's Ark because they're just simply not aware of all the other stories as well. Yes. I Yeah, I think that you're right. People are not aware mm -hmm. of all the other stories yep. and, and the intricacies in those stories. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and a lot of parallels as well. They're, yeah. you know, they're, they're actually near identical with you know, animals being brought on board and one person's specific family being responsible for controlling the ship and so on. And, um, yeah. So. Well, what did Van Tassel maintain about Adam and Eve and well, the Ten Commandments? I mean, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, again, you know, Adam and Eve is a very sort of simplistic story of these two people who, you know, kind of um, lived um, in the Garden of Eden. You know, it comes across, I hate to say, because I'm, I'm truly not saying it to offend people who do take it literally, but it kind of sounds like, like a parable or a fairy story of, or a distortion, you know, of, of a historical event. Now, when you look at Van Tassel's story, he came to believe that, Adam and Eve were not sort of one male and one female. He came to believe that they were the terms of like an ancient race. Um, and you had the male of the species and you had the female, Adam and Eve. In the same way, you have man and woman. Yes. Adam and Eve, as he saw it, as his alien contest probably told him, Adam and Eve were they sort of the ancient names for something like men and women. Mm -hmm. um, but again, over time, it became distorted, not, because, not necessarily maliciously, but because over time, stories do get distorted. You know, you, can, you get ten people who witness a car accident. They all tell a slightly different story from their perspective, and then over the years, you know, things get, like Chinese whispers, you know, the story gets distorted and so on. And, well, the, um, well, the Old Testament is not that old. Uh, in fact, it is not as old as many of these other stories. No, that's right. And I mean, Van Tassel sort of recognized this, and he sort of incorporated just ancient religions, period, into yeah. his, his story. And um, as far as the Ten Commandments are concerned, when you mention that, he believed that the Ten Commandments were not sort of literal tablets delivered from God, but he pointed to, you know, Noah going up into the mountain and the burning bush, he perceived the burning bush as like a glowing UFO. And he believed that the Ten Commandments were essentially laws written by the so-called Space Brothers, as he called them, as a means to try and rein in mankind's um, destructive tendencies and try and formulate a way for us to all live in peace with one another. In other words, it was sort of alien visitors trying to give us a kickstart and a friendly kickstart yeah. by delivering these um, tablets, if they were tablets, to Moses and, you know, trying to spread the word. But unfortunately, I guess over the years, as history has shown, we haven't done a very good job of uh, sticking to them, unfortunately. But. Yeah, boy, that's true. <laughs> oh, there's no honor. <laughs> wow. Hoover classified a report on the 16th of November, 1954. Why did he classify it, and what was in it? Oh, you're, you're talking about the Van, the Van Tassel report? Yes. 
Yeah, well, what's interesting is that George Van Tassel um, was actually um, somebody who was watched very closely by the FBI. You know, a lot of people have said, well, this is all nonsense. But Van Tassel's FBI file is like 200 pages long. Oh, my and, goodness. And it's now being declassified. And also contained within the file is about um, a, co a, num a couple of hundred more pages of his photocopied pamphlets for the he used to put a newsletter out in the 50s and 60s and all those are in there as well wow. the FBI even went out to visit him at Giant Rock and um, and chat with him um, and not from like a, um, a threatening sense they you know they asked the, the reports which are now in the public domain talk about how Van Tassel claimed he'd been out in the desert late one night and he had this urge like this feeling to um go to one particular part of the desert and he said this sort of gleaming ufo came down and he was kind of given directions and information in sort of an altered state almost like what you would call like a shamanic state you know if you look at native shamans across the world in ancient cultures you know they would go out to isolated spots and they would very often sort of ingest psychedelics um, to put their mind into an altered state, and then they would have these visionary experiences from the gods. Well, that's almost like Van Tassel. He felt this weird, compelling <coughs> feeling to go out, and um, he said he would get these messages. Sometimes the, he would see the entities. Other times the message would be sort of like downloaded into his mind. And yeah. uh, all this is reported in the FBI's files about what the aliens looked like and what they were doing here and what they wanted. And... When you read it like that, it sounds like, you know, they weren't laughing at him. They were sort of taking the perspective of, of having an interest in knowing what he got to say, which kind of, again, makes it very uh, sort of noteworthy. And uh, it was only in the 19, late 1980s that the Van Tassel file was declassified and people got to see it. But Van Tassel was actually just one of many of the so-called contactees that were watched by the FBI in the 50s. Uh, and who were making these various claims. And uh, it's sort of a fascinating part of not just the UFO history, but the FBI's history as well as to how and why they got involved in looking into all this. Oh, boy. Well, uh, how does all of this play into moon dust? Mm. <laughs> I mean, what is this? Well, Project Moon Dust was um, a U.S. military program to recover um, artifacts and technologies that were perceived as being useful to, to the US military. The project still exists today, but we don't know what the name's called. It has a classified name because the name um, Moondust was compromised a number of years ago when some of the files surfaced and the name shouldn't have been... The name should have been censored by the censoring people in the agency and they forgot to censor it. <laughs> and so the name came tumbling out and then people said, well, what's Moondust? But... Um, for the most part, Project Moondust deals with things like, you know, say, for example, a Russian satellite crashed in the ocean. The Project Moondust team, which is like a quick reaction military team, would go out and recover it before the Russians could get it themselves and then ship it back to the U.S. so our people could look at it and try and determine if, you know, are the Russians ahead of us in satellite technology or behind us or can we learn something from their technology? Or if, you know, um, they captured a, a crashed... Uh, Chinese fighter plane. They would sort of study the the technology and see how it compared to ours in terms of, you know, the level of technology. So that's the sort of thing Moon Dust got involved in. But there's a, an interesting story I talk about in the book about supposedly Moon Dust having an interest in the Noah's Ark story, and which would make sense, you know, because their their entire role was to capture what's known as foreign technology, and foreign technology is a very vague term that could cover you know, a, a Russian tank to a, a crashed UFO. Yeah. You know, it's anything that's, it's any sort of technology that's non-American is basically what they would look for. Um, but obviously, for the most part, potential enemy technology. Uh, but there's a, an interesting story I talk about, as I said, that supposedly a moon dust team actually did make its way to Mount Ararat. They were reportedly parachuted in, almost like a, like a black ops delta um, type unit and reportedly found what they described as like a huge hollowed out metallic device now whether we would call that sort of the hull of a ship or you know imagine the fuselage of an aircraft ripped apart with, you know some sort of aerial vehicle we just don't know but by all 
accounts at least, it was metallic. Now, if it was metallic, then that sort of takes us far and away from the whole issue of, you know, a huge rotting wooden old boat. Yes. Um, but unfortunately, uh, and I always point this out to people, you know, from the difference between what I can prove and what I can't prove. I can prove through the official files that there's been deep interest on the part of the CIA and the Air Force in whatever is on Mount Ararat. The moon dust story is an interesting one, but it's only, um, it's like a, a word of mouth one so far, you know, it's come from the grandfather, or the father, I think, of the person who related the story. But that doesn't make it any less important or truthful. Um, you know, it just means we've got to sort of try and, um, you know, figure out where the story's going to lead, you know. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> There's a lot of mysteries on this planet. Um, let's jump to the pyramids. In 947 AD, Masudi wrote that levitation was how the pyramids were built, and he did a 30-volume work um, about the history of the world, which I think would be very interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah he was a fascinating guy. He sort of, um, we were talking about Indiana Jones earlier. He was kind of like a 10th century Indiana Jones, you know, wow. sort of a, an adventurer who would travel around and chronicle things and, um, you know, essentially to try and figure out the history of the planet. And um, I mention him because he uncovered some very interesting stories and um, tales about how the Egyptian pyramids were supposedly built. Now, one of the theories today, quite a popular theory is that they were built using some sort of like anti-gravity or levitation yeah. and in this ancient manuscript that Masudi put together he talked about how he'd been told that the ancient Egyptians long before sort of the acknowledged Egyptians they had they possessed the secrets of how they could move the stones and they would use these iron rods which they would sort of tap the stones and they would levitate into the air and they could be pushed along almost like a little rowing boat on water you know you just gently push them and they would move oh. about six or seven feet above the ground and um they would go down these alleyways in the desert which were just they were alleyways which were defined by more of these rods sort of standing vertically out of the sand and what it sounds like they were talking about what Masuri was talking about. It was a technology that we're trying to develop now. We're not having much success, apart from with small objects, which is known as acoustic lev levitation. Yes. And it's where you use directed sound waves to lift objects into the air. And uh, it's, it's kind of the, the easiest way to think of it is, you know, it's kind of like if somebody sings really high pitch, they can shatter a wine glass. You know, that kind yeah. of thing. It's using sound to achieve. Um, an event or an, an end on um, on a solid object, and it kind of sounds like Masudi was talking about acoustic levitation. And most nations around the world that possess massive old structures built out of gigantic stones have stories about the stones being moved by sound. For example, there's one from South America where the stones are supposedly moved by a magical flute. There's one concerning Stonehenge in England, where I'm originally from, um, where the Stonehenge blocks were supposedly moved to the um, to sound to the sound of music and dancing. And of course, one of the most famous stories is the walls of Jericho brought down by the sound of a trumpet, yes. which is kind of in reverse. And the story, and because acoustic levitation could supposedly be used as a weapon, so you've got trumpets bringing down walls. Now, I don't think it was literal trumpets any more than I think that the stones in South America were put together by a magical, or moved by a magical flute. Yeah. You know, but all this is a distortion of one thing, sound being used to move stones. And this guy Masudi, Ali Masudi, he actually wrote all about this in this ancient manuscript about the Egyptian stones just sort of floating through the air with these me mechanical, excuse me, these metallic rods being, in essence, the, the primer to get them moving. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating story suggesting that either the ancient Egyptians had a, developed a technology or more likely, I think, inherited it from an even older race that yes. we probably don't know anything about, or possibly from extraterrestrials or both. And it's a technology that today has been lost, 
you know, we can't do it now apart from just very small scale. Yeah. You know, we can literally, literally lift things like the size of a penny or a coin or a marble, you know, and that's yeah. about it. <laughs> uh, we certainly can't move stones, but maybe ancient man may not have had computers and cars and the internet or whatever, or their equivalents, but they may have had very alternative technologies that worked in a totally different fashion that we just don't figure, we cannot figure them out. Exactly. You know, I've been to the Mayan ruins and uh -huh. the Aztec Pyramid of the Sun and all of that, and my thought is that these people inherited these edifices yes. mm -hmm. and then used them for human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I don't think originally that was the intention mm -hmm. of these buildings. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think where a lot of people, you know, people are such say their, their natural opinion, if you like, yeah. is that the the Egyptians, you know, they suddenly history is very simplistic, I should say. Yeah. If, so if you look at history, you know, we went from being cavemen to building pyramids. Yeah, <laughs> that's how the history books kind of portray. You know, people lived in caves, and the man would go out and hunt a mammoth, you know, and then and pull the body back, and he hit his wife around the head with a club, you know. And yeah. <laughs> pull her then, hair. Yeah, you pull her on the floor by the hair, yeah. <laughs> and then the next thing is, we're, we're moving 10 ton stones 50 feet into the air. And of course, it cannot be that simple. Right. And I think what's happened is that many of these ancient structures, the technology was not developed by the Egyptians or the Mayans. Right. I think they inherited it from races that far, you know, extremely contrary to what history tells us, you know, that civilization began sort of five, six, seven thousand years ago. I actually think there could have been highly advanced races, um, you know, talking 50, 60, 70,000, 100,000 years ago, which is highly controversial. And, you know, they may have flourished and wiped themselves out and then they become somebody else's folklore and, then, and mythology, kind of like us with the Atlanteans. You know, people say this fantastic race, and people say, oh, there's no such place as Atlantis. You know, they may be saying the same about us 50,000 years from now, that, oh, there, were, there weren't people who could fly metal things in the sky and go to the moon and all this, you know. Yeah. They're just, just folklore, you know. We're the first, and, and we think we're the first. So I think that maybe some of these ancient structures, they may have been built when they were supposedly built, but there's still a lot of questions about the Sphinx that may be far older. But I think they were built in fact the technology I don't think it was developed just four or five thousand years ago and I think possibly the ancients may have hidden the technology as well when they were finished with it to prevent it falling into the wrong hands in terms of you know somebody weaponizing it or whatever you know if you could use sound to destroy a city yeah that, that would be you know sort of sending a tornado in or you know, a 200 mile an hour wind or something like that. Oh boy. <laughs> you, you imagine the destruction you could do. Oh and yeah. You have like plausible deniability. You could say it's nothing to do with us, it was Mother Nature. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, you, you talk about um, the nine, the nine. Yeah. God at whom and his nine children yeah. were aliens question mark from Sirius question mark yeah the, the, the story of the nine is an interesting one nine kind of plays a role in a lot of sort of occult teachings and um, rituals and a lot of things like this but there's this story of like the nine a sort of it's some people describe it as like a race other people as almost like an ethereal intelligence without form yeah. that, that sort of played a manipulative role in the formation of the human race over the years and um, you know sometimes in a teaching um, process um, and sometimes in a more manipulative process but um, the idea that they're sort of higher entities some people might call them extraterrestrial some people might call them uh, you know so interdimensional maybe even but, but something that's a higher intelligence than us that has sort of, you know, played a role in significant aspects of the development of the human race over the years, and they continue to do so. And uh, they've been pointed as coming from the star system Sirius, 
Um, but even though some people talk about them being literal aliens from Sirius, they also talk about them having the ability to contact us via mind without even leaving their star system. Um, so there's you know, a lot of theories, but not many sort of definitive answers, unfortunately. Hmm. Well, my goodness. And they were alleged to have seeded the Earth in Tibet? Yeah, this is one of the stories that they supposedly came down in Tibet. And, and that's interesting is that whether it's, you know, you also got the Anunnaki coming down. You've got the, the, um, the Nine, you know, and uh, you find stories like this all around the world. The stories of Mexico, the gods coming down. And yeah. I, think, I think you can look at it, you can take it like the literal god approach. I kind of take it the view that maybe over the years, possibly even different races or the same civilization of different times have come down and they've tried to upgrade the population in different places, you know, and maybe at times it's worked and other times it hasn't worked, you know. Yeah, very interesting. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Um, this is a little bit off, but Puharik met Geller in Tel Aviv. What was that all about, about the hypnotizing? Well, yeah, I mean, um, Andre Japu Harik was a very um, interesting character. Um, his, his research into the powers of the mind actually um, went back to the late 1940s. And um, what was interesting is that he was looking into things like um, psychic phenomena, but also uh, past life regression, reincarnation, and things like this. And what's particularly interesting is that the uh, U.S. military took a great interest in all this um, in terms of actually funding a lot of his work. Uh -huh. um, and much of it dealt with uh, one particular person he was working with who claimed uh, to be sort of a reincarnation of a significant Egyptian figure. And none of this was actually... Um, sort of dismissed or laughed at by the military. They, they were very fascinated by it. And it all revolved, <coughs> excuse me, around something <coughs> known as a sacred mushroom. The idea that as ancient man and shamanic people, shamanic characters will tell you that psychedelics like mushrooms, you know, people think that um, it just sends you into a spaced out situation. You know, you start seeing pink elephants around the room, whatever. It's actually not that simple. People who know how to you psych and I, you know, I'm not saying this to endorse it over the radio or whatever. Yeah. Right. What I'm saying is that people who use psychedelics and allow their mind to be trained and go into altered states, there's a strong belief in many quarters that they actually have the ability to enter an alt not just an altered state of mind, but enter like an altered realm or a dimension which isn't accessible when your mind is in a normal state. And that was one of the things that Poharich was looking into. So that kind of gives you um, the the whole issue of, um, you, you know, his background, so to speak, and uh, as to, um, you know, what was going on. But uh, but Yuri Geller, yeah, I mean, he was an interesting character, or is an interesting character. You know, he's someone who was touching on certain areas also, um, as it relates to, you know, the sort of powers of the mind, the power which was involved in, and... Um, you know, it kind of, I guess from, from my perspective, it demonstrates two things, that government agencies know about the power of the mind, um, and they also know it's somehow linked, that ancient man had a far more knowledgeable understanding of the human mind. Now, to the question that you brought up about Geller and Paharich specifically, well, in the early 70s, I think it's 1971, um, Paharich and Geller... Um, got together, met together in Tel Aviv and um, Paharich actually was a very good hypnotist and succeeded in putting um, Gela under hypnosis and um, this sort of um, the, the story is that it may actually have sort of wired if you like or kick-started um, much of Gela's sort of uh, psychic um, ESP based skills and so forth and from there what supposedly happened is that Geller started to get these messages, not unlike George Van Tassel got, kind of like a downloaded, channeled message um, from an alien entity supposedly known as Spectra. And this was sort of like a, almost like an, an early internet-based 
Imagine the internet becoming uh, sentient, as they call it. In other words, becomes intelligent. You know, it's one of the fears about our internet that one day it could become so big and powerful and networked that it would be, it would develop its own consciousness. Yeah. It'd become like a living being. And supposedly the Spectra was like a, an intelligent computer. And um, Puharich actually thought that Spectra might have been um, one of the so-called nine. Now, according to the channel messages that um, Geller received, that's what Spectra claimed to be, one of the nine. Yeah. But as I always point out to people, particularly people who dabble in channel messages and Ouija boards and getting contacts, you always have to be careful because yeah. I think sometimes the messages are real. But people, you know, I, I don't mess around with this sort of stuff because I know enough to know that there's a very dark side to the paranormal as well. And people can find themselves on the receiving end of very malevolent entities that masquerade and, and deceive the person who's receiving the message. Well, and you can, can open... All sorts of problems. Yes. You, know, bad door. you can open right doors and you can open the wrong doors. And if you're yeah. in a mindset where you're easily manipulated, or perhaps a bit of a timid person, you know, this is where it comes, you get things like stories of demons in traditional biblical stories. And in the Middle Eastern teachings, you have stories of the jinn. There isn't actually much difference between demons and the jinn. They're right. both sort of mani manipul excuse me, manipulative, malevolent entities that hate the human race, essentially, and will do anything they can to destroy us or just plague us and menace us. Um, and I always tell people that when you're dealing with messages, kind of like the spectrum message claiming to be one of the nine, you really have to be careful as to whether you want to open all these doors before you actually do so. You know? Yeah, because you may never be able to close it. No, and there's a lot of stories of people, you know, sort yeah. of having runs of bad luck, ill health, suicide, mental illness, because, you know, they started doing something that was exciting, you know, kind of classic teenager thing, you know, parents are out, let's get the beer out and, you know, drink beer and play with a Ouija board on a Friday night oh, while the dear. folks are out. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, most people, it's, it's a bit of harmless fun, but sometimes things happen and, you know, people become obsessed by it and their life gets ruined, you know, that yeah. happens. So I always say to people, when you're dealing with things like this Spectra story and downloaded messages, have an open mind. Don't just believe everything you're told. Don't believe because you want to believe it. You know, just yeah. take it each step very carefully. Absolutely good advice. <laughs> Well, huh, let's go to, well, first, the CIA fakes stories and memes. And you find that kind of all over the Internet now, where stories have changed ever so slightly, and uh, memes, people repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, that's... <laughs> dangerous and and interesting mm. well yeah i mean sometimes you know when we're dealing in, in today's world excuse me where it's you know very fraught world and unstable and so on and particularly with you know a lot of our enemies we don't know where our enemies are because they don't dress like uniforms like the germans did in the second world war the, or the soviets did. well you know? the united states is very good at creating boogeymen and enemies oh boy well, I mean, uh, we, we also, you know, we have a lot of genuine enemies as well. A lot of people who just don't like the West, unfortunately. That, that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big argument. There's a, two sides to every story, but there are a lot of people that don't like us. And sometimes this requires the use of what's called disinformation, where, yeah. you know, sort of a, a semi-fabricated story will be put out to see who comes and listens and then that person they try and reel that person in to figure out who they are and what are they doing and so forth so um you know it's um it, we, we live in a strange world and um you know that's and espionage and secret yeah. <laughs> they change as as you know the the world changes in terms of what the requirements are to figure out what's going on you know so it's a uh, very much different to sort of 50 or 60 years ago when it was in, in some respects, more straightforward as to who was doing what and why. And today, yeah. it's very much sort of a grey area as to everything that's going on. Well, let's hop to Sidonia. Mm -hmm. 
the faith on Mars, um, and the Sphinx. Um, is the faith on Mars real, or is it intentionally blurred, yeah. or is it the face of the Sphinx mm -hmm. before the Sphinx was damaged? And how old is the Sphinx? Well, um, the the story. Well, the, the the face on Mars certainly exists. You know, it's there. The big question is, what is it? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> um, it's it can be found in an area of Mars called Cydonia, and the, the the face itself. People don't realise actually how big it is. It's sort of um, a huge. mile by half a mile. Yeah. So it's huge. It, people think it's like the size of one of the pyramids or the Sphinx in Egypt, and we've just managed to get a couple of good close-up pictures we haven't it, it literally is like a mile by half a mile so it's a massive um piece of work if it is a piece of work and, and personally i think it is i think if you look at some of the later photographs they're not particularly good renditions i mean they're clear but they don't seem to show as much of a face as some of the earlier pictures did but if you look at it from the perspective of where there are vague outlines you can actually make like a linear face from it um, now people have talked about if, if this was built on Mars now we, we must be talking a tremendous amount of time ago you know I mean we're not talking six seven or even ten thousand or twenty thousand years ago with sort of ancient Egypt and even earlier cultures even sort of the, the best minds who've sort of studied the face on Mars have said you know we might be talking a million uh, excuse me a minimum of like a quarter of a million years ago. And you imagine what the Sphinx, our Sphinx, might look like a quarter of a million years from now, never mind a couple of thousand years. Yeah. It probably would be massively degraded and destroyed and if there had been earthquakes or meteorite strikes or the atmosphere degraded, all of that would sort of put pressure on the, you know, the design and over time it would degrade <coughs> because <laughs> things degrade. Um, and so in that respect, because we can make out a vague outline of a face, even on the not so good pictures, I think we're looking at something that was carved artificially by intelligent beings, probably a minimum of like 100,000 years ago or more, at a time when Mars was a very stable planet with an atmosphere that you know creatures could live on, possibly not unlike us. Now, if you look at a lot of the pictures that are coming back from Mars today, many of them contain anomalies in them that NASA say, oh, it's just, you know, it's a stone at a strange angle or something. But there are some really weird ones. If you Google uh, Mars plus photograph plus lizard, you'll see a picture that came just a few months ago, or possibly weeks ago even, from the, la the latest um, NASA rover. And it looks just like a lizard. You know, you can see the tail, the body, the neck, the legs. But NASA says, oh, it's just a stone. It looks like a lizard. <laughs> There's another one that almost looks kind of like a rat crossed with a, a squirrel. There's so many strange anomalies. And if you type into Google Banyan Tree plus Mars, B-A-N-Y-A-N, -A -N, Banyan Tree plus Mars, you see what looks like, it looks like you're looking out of the window of a plane going over like Arizona where there's desert and trees and little bushes. That, that's what it looks like. Mm. But NASA said it's all ice crystals. But if you look at those pictures, they look like an aerial photograph of a desert shot with, you know, bushes and little trees here and there. So I actually think that Mars is not the dead world we think it is. It's obviously not teeming with gigantic cities, you know, like New York City or Moscow or London. At least I, not on the surface. Not on the surface. <laughs> That's one of the interesting theories, is that maybe if there was a Martian race, they went underground. Yeah. And one of the theories is, what if the face on Mars was sort of an entrance point and there's you know, like a vast, under, like, the, like the pyramids, you know. Yeah. The pyramids are like a network of tunnels. Yes. But the outside, it just looks like a giant block of stone. Maybe that's the same with the face on Mars. Now, what's interesting about the face on Mars, it does have sort of <coughs> this um, sphinx-like appearance. And also in Cydonia, you have a number of formations that look eerie like the pyramids. But in the, the whereas the pyramids are four-sided, the Poseidonian ones are like five-sided, um, but they look like pyramids. And the official story is, well, they look slanted and pyramid-like because the wind has eroded them over the years. 
but you know, I come back to they look like pyramids. And on one of the pictures, there looks what looks just like a little doorway at the foot of one of the pyramids. And it almost looks like it's in shadow, as if it's open. You know, and the shadow is sort of pushing in inside. Um, and so when you look at these stories about Mars possibly still being a viable planet, things underground, face on Mars, these pyramids, I actually wonder if the ancient extraterrestrials that may have come here and <coughs> kind of formulated, you know, human civilization, maybe they had time, you know, to evacuate a certain percentage of their population to here. Maybe that's why we have different cultures on the planet, you know, and um, different races. Um, yes. Maybe that's why we've had different, even like Homo sapien man, Cro-Magnon, uh, Neanderthal man. Maybe there were manipulations at a genetic level of the original humans. Maybe there was mating going on between, it sounds controversial, but if the Martians were so close to us, it, you know, if you imagine there was an even older race, and they seeded a race on Mars and a seeded race on Earth, which were, you know, and over time they both sort of developed and changed to according, you know, to their evolutionary development or whatever. But they were, they had the same original um, root civilization. Then I think it's possible that the Martians, in some respect, may have been almost like us. So ironically, if the Martians came here, maybe in some way they saved their race by interbreeding with us and in some respects we are the martians you know i have got another fellow that i do interviews with um nick and he agrees with you <laughs> only <laughs> he goes so far to say that uh, the white race are the martians huh. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far because I don't know how we approve that. <laughs> that's, that's quite controversial as well. I'm sure people, some people might even find that a bit offensive, you know, from, yeah. you know, saying, oh, well, the Martians won with all the power and the technology and they just happen to be white. You know, that's, yeah. that's kind of, you know what I'm trying to say. Yes, I do. Um, but what I, what I would say is that I do think the idea that, I mean, if you look at it, if we went, if something happened to our world, and we had, say, five years' notice that in five years a meteorite's going to hit the Earth and there's no way to, we're going to survive it. It's going to be like extinction. Yeah. And if we had the ability to travel to a nearby planet which was habitable, we might, when we got there, we would probably, obviously being human, we would want to preserve our legacy of civilization. So we would probably start building things there similar to what we have here. You know, we want to try yeah. and continue our culture. We wouldn't just want to start a totally new culture. We want things we're familiar with and we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that's why in South America and Egypt, pyramids suddenly sprung up. Yeah. You know, the pyramids on Mars, maybe the Martians, you know, their world was gone. You imagine how we would feel if the Earth was destroyed. You know, you'd be yeah. like a massive, such a shock that your whole, entire planet, history, culture, everything you knew is no longer exi no longer exists. Yeah. How that would make you feel. Maybe the Martians, like um, the survivors that made their way here, essentially sort of said, well, let's try and at least preserve some of our legacy and we'll teach the the people here about pyramid technology and um, and it'll be our lasting legacy. You know, these will last for thousands and thousands of years and we never will really die mm -hmm. out. You know, I kind of think maybe something like that. Happened. Yeah. Do you think that the pyramids, especially the big pyramid at Giza, do you think it is a machine of some sort? Um, that's a good question. I mean, we know, <coughs> excuse me, before, I mean, look at it now, it's just stones on the outside. A lot of people don't realize it actually had a, a coating on it beforehand. Yes. Uh, and when the sun would hit it, it would be like, it was like a gleaming, shining illuminated electric almost I don't mean electric literally but I mean like, almost like electrified gigantic shining pyramid That's you could it see it, it from space yeah it, it was if you imagine like a pyramid made out of reflecting mirrors and yeah. you're firing like a like a camera flash against it that's yeah. what it looked like it was just like this huge gleaming um, pyramid it would have been a fantastic sight to see now there are people who um, talk about the acoustics of the pyramid 
sort of resonating and the idea that this may be tied in with its construction if it was used, if acoustic um, levitation was used. But people have also talked about it potentially possessing energies um, that could be utilised if we understood those technologies and how they work. The problem is we don't. Um, one man who thought the pyramids were somehow connected was a, he didn't die too long ago, a man named Bruce Cathy, who did a lot of research oh, into yes. pyramid power. And he felt there were sort of energy grids around the world that extraterrestrials thousands of years ago, they kind of used these energy grids and lines, uh, like we jump on, you know, the tube or the train. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, our equivalent of the railway track was like these atmospheric energy grids and lines and he felt that the pyramids were somehow tied in with them in terms of like an originating energy source that would feed the lines and vice versa and so on so um yeah they, i i don't rule that out at all i think um if you look at the stories of the pyramids you know they they certainly go much further than just the notion that um you know that they were there to sort of bury the pharaohs in or whatever yeah um the Sphinx, mm -hmm. how old, I've heard a lot of different mm -hmm. aging, um, ages for the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. How old actually is the Sphinx, in your opinion? Um, well, that's a, very, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I don't pretend to know how old it is, but I've got, I've got a good idea how old it isn't. And I don't think it's as old, I mean, I don't think it's the age of sort of the conventional wisdom that people talk about as sort of, you know, the figures have been banded sort of three, four, five thousand years old. But the problem with the Sphinx, there were actually two issues. One, uh, a number of people, a number of researchers feel that the face of the, of the Sphinx has been re-sculpted over the years. That yeah. The face it has now isn't the original face. Some people talk about it having like a feline face, like a lion originally. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, admittedly, you know, the head is quite tiny compared to the body. It does look a little bit odd. Yeah. Now, the other thing, um, this is an area where a lot of very good research has been done on this subject by uh, Robert Anthony West, excuse me, John Anthony West and Robert Schock. The idea that the, what is clearly weathering from water um, yes. on the Sphinx, um, the, the time when conventional history and archaeology tells us it was built, you know, the Egypt wasn't pouring down with rain all the time, massive floods. It was like it is now, pretty much. Um, but the extensive weathering on the Sphinx looks like it's been battered endlessly for, you know, years upon years by nothing but pouring rainwater. Now, at a time when Egypt was sort of, you know, forested, if you like, or, um, you know, subject to massive rain, and, and it looked totally different to how it did today. You've got to go back tens, of, well, you know, 12, 15, 20,000 years ago. People have even pushed it back further than that in some wow. cases. You know, they've talked about 40,000 years ago. Now, of course, when you sort of get into these areas, it is controversial, I'll be the first to admit. But when you look at this weathering, it's difficult to come up with an explanation for it beyond the idea that it's rainwater and rainwater in such incredible amounts that it's unheard of in recent, relatively recent Egyptian history. So that's one of the prime reasons why people feel that, um, you know, we're judging the age of the Sphinx wrong. And one of the interesting theories, sort of fascinating one, is that... Um, Maybe the Egyptians sort of inherited it. Maybe the Egyptians didn't even know who built it, but they stumbled on it and were like, wow, this is cool. You know, we'll yeah. model this according to how our gods look. You know, it's kind of like somebody in the jungle stumbling across a crashed aircraft and decided to turn it into a home. You know what I mean? Yeah. That sort of thing. Um, so I don't think we'll ever really know uh, how old it really is or there'll be any sort of firm consensus. But uh, personally, I think it's far older. I don't think the Egyptians actually built it. I think they inherited it. Yes, like like the pyramid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because it, to my knowledge, there are no pyramids on the planet exactly like the Great Pyramid. 
No, I mean, you know, the, the Egyptian one is p pretty much unique. And, um, and what's interesting is there's actually a very badly made pyramid in Egypt as well, which kind of suggests maybe somebody, you know, why was it this one bad was made so badly, but yet the others are sort of pristine and perfect? Well, maybe it's because they were made by different people at different times. And I don't yeah. just mean different aspects of the Egyptian, of the pharaoh line. I mean, way before that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is very fascinating. And anyone who stumbles across information or <clears throat> spouts uh, information that could perk up the CIA's ears, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that's why when I do my work, for the most part, I use, like, the Freedom Information Act, you know. Uh, yeah. Because I, I, I sort of take what I feel is the responsible way. I, I sort of legally, not illegally, <laughs> legally, you know, apply for government files to be declassified. And yeah. I interview retired people who, you know, may have played a role. And so I, I always try and do it from the same perspective, because I do a lot of regular journalism, so I try and do it all from the same perspective of, of regular journalism, of investigating a story. You know, I'm not someone who's, um, you know, waiting on the street corners for somebody some Mr. X to bring me envelopes at midnight or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, I, I don't go, I, I don't do that. Um, I'm sure a lot of people find that kind of, uh, you know, sort of exciting and adventurous, but that's never happened to me, honestly. You know, I, what I do, I sort of apply, as I said, apply through the Freedom Information Act to get files. I go to government archives and go through the released material and see what we can find out. I try and put the picture together and then, you know, where possible at least, visit the locations and try and, you know, get some understanding from actually being there as well. And, um, you know, just, as I said, uh, approach an investigation into the mysteries of Mars the same way as I would investigate in a, like I said earlier, like a murder case for a, a magazine or a newspaper or whatever, you know. Well, do you think, in your opinion, that we already have people on Mars? Um, well, you know, that's an interesting theory because there have been a lot of stories over the years about what we might call like a secret space program that, yeah. what, that possibly NASA doesn't even know anything about. You know, a lot of people have said, well, NASA has a secret space program. I actually don't think NASA does at all. No. I think NASA has a space program, period, and it's the... And it's the space program we know about. Yes. But there's been a lot of rumours over the years of sort of like a secret space program. People have said, well, how on earth could it exist? How would they get the rockets into space without everybody seeing them? You know, because the space shuttle, when that takes off, or when the old Saturn rockets that put men on the moon took off, you know, you have this huge rocket and all these flames coming out. You could see it for miles. But what people forget is that those were chemical rockets. You know, that's the reason they're so big is because you just, like with the, the craft that went to the moon, you know, the, it was just a little capsule at the top. Yeah. Where the three guys sat. You know, it was like the size of a small car. But you had this huge rocket below it because you needed that much chemical propellant to get it into space and yes. get it outside the Earth's atmosphere. But if you developed a technology where you could do away with chemical propellants where you could have something like an anti-gravity type um, system which could fly at tremendous speeds then you could, you know, you could paint it black and have it take off from the desert at 10 o'clock at night and it could be the size of, you know, something like a car. Yes. Uh, and no one would ever see it. No one would hear it. Because no one would see any flames because there'd be no chemical propellant like a huge rocket. So in other words, Granted, it's theoretical and hypothetical, but you could have craft zipping back and forth to the moon or Mars, and no one would ever know, because there's nothing really to see. There's no flames, there's no gigantic craft, and it would be silent. Um, and so I actually think, I, I wouldn't rule, rule out, I wouldn't be surprised, I've never seen any evidence, but I wouldn't be surprised if one day, you know, it was found that there had been clandestine missions back to the moon yeah. and possibly even to Mars it, you know that I wouldn't sort of drop down in a dead faint if that happened you know I, I would find it actually quite plausible oh yes yes well while we're talking about that do you think that things can be made to literally 
vanish to disappear from our dimension? Um, well, w what I do believe is that there are multi-dimensions. Now, whether or not we as a species have actually perfected how to do that, I'm not sure. But I do think there are sort of intelligent entities from elsewhere that can do it and, and, and are able to come into our world and back again. You know, like with the UFO subject, um, I often think that maybe the subject or the phenomenon isn't necessarily solely extraterrestrial. I think there could be a good chance that some of these, well, not just a good chance, I actually do believe that some of these things kind of exist in other, I guess in, in simple terms, we call them dimensions, but we're not really sure what they are, but yeah. other realms of existence that kind of coexist alongside us, parallel to us, yes. and that if you know and understand the technology or how to do it, you can zip in and out of these realities. And I think that's what sort of shamans did in the past, you know, with things like psychedelics. Um, they were able to sort of get a glimpse into these other worlds, but they didn't know how to control it. And right. so and it seems like with the remote viewers, the so-called psychic spies, spies that the government used in the 70s to spy on the Russians, you know, they left their bodies and they were able to see something on the other side of the world. That's kind of like, not so sort of much entering another dimension, but part of you is leaving your regular dimensions but it's nothing physical you know it's part of the mind yeah and i think if we could understand how to sort of maneuver amongst these dimensions you know the who knows how many there are and i think this possibly accounts for a lot of stories things like you mentioned earlier like the jinn and demons yeah. you know they supposedly come from hell or from these multi magical realms i i actually think probably a lot of these entities, very evil ones, uh, probably can be explained as something that coexists with us. And it, I think it can be explained by science. I don't think you need to suggest it's being conjured up from hell or, you know, Hades or wherever. I think these things can coexist with us, but still, you know, have the traits and goals of, like, demons and jinn, you know, to destroy us. Yeah. But I don't think they live in, like, a fiery pit. I think they live in... Um, you know, a dimension that they're able to jump from theirs to ours and back again. And when they're in ours, they kind of, you know, make havoc for us or whatever. Wow. Well, the reason I asked you that uh, is because of this Malaysian flight. Um, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Australia mm -hmm. has stopped uh, searching for it. Mm -hmm. uh, they said they found an oil slick, but the kind of oil it is, has nothing to do with uh, any kind of aeronautics. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think happened with that plane? Well, you know, I mean, it's a weird story. It's become like a, a detective story almost, you know, never mind uh, just a, a tragedy. But, um, you know, I think one of the big problems is not, not the, the sheer amount of water on the planet, you know, and it could have gone in potentially several directions. Um, is making it more and more difficult to know where to look. You know, when you're talking about thousands of square miles yeah. of ocean, very deep in parts, and, you know, if it broke up in the air or broke up as it hit the water, you know, the parts might be quite small apart from sort of like the fuselage and the wings. You know, the fuselage may have cracked into two or three pieces. The wings may have been sort of fairly intact, but again, if you're looking in the wrong place... Mm -hmm. um, who knows? But uh, I think, you know, I think there's very little doubt that a decision was made by someone, you know, whether the pilot, the co-pilot or, or somebody who took control of the plane, you know, from the inside to, to, turn, to delib deliberately take it off its course. Um, but I guess the big question is why? You know, was it somebody just went crazy on board. I, don't know. I mean, there was that thing where they mentioned about the last message was supposedly from the co-pilot when it should have been actually from the pilot. Um, you know, that was a normal protocol. Um, so I think, I think there's far more to be uncovered, but I don't think it's just at all a case of the plane having a malfunction and ditching. Yeah. I think something happened in the cockpit where somebody had an agenda and it was, and it was taken off its course. Now, whether that was take it somewhere else or to ditch it in the ocean or you know who know who knows what it was but i, I think that we're going to find far more on this you know in the in the near future i think 
Well, there there are plane crashes frequently. I mean, not real frequently, but I can't remember a plane crash that has garnered so much intense attention. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the main reason is is because it's literally vanished. <laughs> you know, that that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Um, I think it was made to go poof. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that's that's one theory. I mean, a lot of people have looked at it from the, uh, are all starting to look at it from the paranormal angle. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think we can rule anything out at this stage. You know, we've got a, a plane missing. We've got no wreckage, no oil. You know, an entire, you know, the passengers, the crew, um, everybody, and all the best skills and technology of, satellites and trackers and you know spy planes and everything else no one's been able to find it so you know there is a genuine puzzle in that sense well it is really strange <laughs> oh boy <laughs> what do you think about uh what's going on in the ukraine oh well you know i think we've got to be very careful with all that i mean um you could sort of go back to the the old days you know and um I think it's, um, even though the Cold War, as it was, has ended, the world is still, as, in many cases, in many respects, it's still as much a, a dangerous place as it was then, in, in many cases more so. Um, but, yeah, I, I think, you know, we've got to be very careful when you've got sort of, when you've got other countries doing stuff like that, you equally have to be balanced out as to what you do or you don't do. Um, you know, in terms of getting involved or not getting involved and getting dragged into things and then it sort of gets bigger and bigger and more people get involved. That's when trouble could start. Well, uh, the United States is backing Nazis in the Ukraine. Not the Crimea, but in the Ukraine. It is absolutely unconscionable. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Well, I've got to be honest, I, I haven't followed the story too much because I think, you know, it's going to, I think it's probably going to iron itself out. I think there's going to be a lot of shouting and, you know, screaming at each other and threats of sanctions and threats of this. Yeah. But at the end of the day, both sides, you know, it is a fact, both sides know that a superpower confrontation, no one can win. That's you know, right. They can shout as much as they like at each other. But when it comes down to it, they know that...